grace. Grace to you was kind of a typical Gentile greeting. If you walked up on the, just like we have our, we have typical greetings. How you doing? How's it going? What's going on? Good to see you. You know, whatever. Um, we have them. Grace to you is a typical Gentile greeting. Now, the Hebrew greeting for the Jews of the audience that Paul was writing was a little bit more um, sacred. Shalom, peace, nothing broken, nothing missing, wholeness. In one word, one word, Jews would see each other and greet one another with a word that literally surmised the wholeness of God. Peace, shalom to you. So Paul, he doesn't say grace to the Gentiles, shalom to the Jews. He says grace and peace. In that one simple greeting that begins all 13 of his letters, he is uniting people that have been divided up until that point in history. He's saying in Christ, brothers and sisters, members of the same church, you get to hold on to your identity that you bring into this Christian relationship, and you also are going to walk together and I'm gonna create a new greeting. I'm gonna Christianize your greeting. I'm not taking away your old one. Grace and peace to you, all of you. You are side by side now. It's important and it's significant. John Piper, um, he actually has a whole sermon on this grace and peace to you because Paul not only begins all 13 letters with grace and peace to you, he ends all 13 letters with grace and peace go with you. Grace and peace to you in the beginning with you at the end. And this is what John Piper has to say about possibly why that is, especially at the beginning. Grace to you. I think it means that at the beginning of his letters, he realizes that they're about to read God's word. It's written on a parchment. They don't have the Bible 2,000 years ago. Somebody's just reading this, probably most likely in a public square. And so this is the word of God to you. Upon hearing this word, grace is coming to you. Through the very speaking of the word of God, grace is coming to us this morning, right now. This letter is a channel of God's grace to you. I think that's beautiful. So that's just kind of, I'm just going to mention three little things about the beginning, about this intro of Paul. Because I think we can skip by introductions, and I think they have a lot to say. That's the first point. Grace and peace to you. In those few words, he's saying, As Christians, we bring with us the identity of our background, and we don't have to let that go. But we're also linking arms with people that are very different with us for a purpose. Next, Paul kind of graciously points out to these folks something that um, he's hoping for them. But he does it in the most beautiful way. Little background, I'm not going to go into much, uh, just because we're going to move on to another passage in a minute. But a little background to the people, the church at Corinth. Again, I've mentioned this in other um, places, but Corinth was a city a little bit like New York City. It kind of was a city that actually grew up overnight because it was a port city. And within about a hundred year span, it went from not being a city at all to being one of the most bustling cities in the Middle East. So it was a port city, it was filled with um, very social status, kind of a melting pot. Like I said, Jews and Gentiles were people at that time in the world, it would have been um, ethnically diverse. There was a whole lot of wealth, people cared a whole lot about what people thought of them, and there was a lot of arrogance. Let me say that again, there was a whole lot of wealth, people cared a lot about what people thought of them, social status, and there was a lot of arrogance. Sound a little familiar? I hope so. Pride took on many facets in this community. And the, a lot of First and Second Corinthians, Paul is kind of addressing different ways pride took the, the face of pride for this church congregation. But the way, and the way that their pride played out, for the most part, had to do with what they spoke and how they thought their minds were somehow more special than everybody else's. For example, they were speaking in tongues, some of the members of the church, not all, but some, and those folks thought they were a little bit more special, a little more spiritual, had a little bit more to offer. So it's interesting what Paul says in his opening document for this church whose mind and whose speech could have used a whole lot of correction. He doesn't say that. He says this in the opening introduction. He says, in every way you've been enriched in God, in him, in speech, in knowledge of every kind. 
just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you. So in every way, he says, in every way, your speech and your knowledge. He chooses to honor their speech and knowledge. I don't, let me try to um, help you understand this. Because it's ironic, and it's subversive, and it's the word of God. <laughs> Another way of looking at it is to think about, like, if there was a spotlight on your life right now on your entire life. And only you and God could see what the spotlight is highlighting. On your whole life. Think about the things that would be sp- on the, in the spotlight that would bring in shame or embarrassment. Or you would know, like, the, like why I couldn't sing the song this morning. But just the areas of my life that are not honoring to him. It's as if Paul, through the Spirit of Christ, is saying to us, I'll use a personal example. I think about myself a lot. I think about what you all think of me. I think about um, when I speak something to someone, I think about what they think or what do they think of this about me. I think way too much about myself, actually. So it would be as if God saying to me in that, so that would be a spotlight that would bring me embarrassment or shame. It would be like him saying to me, Sarah, you know what? I created you actually to think about yourself in the right context and for the right reasons. It would be like God saying to me, Sarah, I actually created you to be the center of the universe in me. To understand I formed you with a whole lot of things in mind. I'll tell you, if I actually heard God speak those words to me, I would be so motivated to be less narcissistic and to say, let me get to know you a little bit better. Teach me. Teach me how to walk with you. Teach me shine your light on me a little bit more. That's what Paul's doing here. It's beautiful. So he's greeting them together. He's saying, the thing that I want to see God and his spirit have his way in your life, that's the thing I'm going to tell you I see in you. Because it's still from him. Your speech, your knowledge, it's from him. It finds its source in him. So we'll give him the glory for it, even though you've got a long way to go. He's giving them hope. He's giving them hope. And lastly, I'm going to move this um, in this passage. So he's giving them hope in a gracious way, and then he's going to point them to the future. And this is kind of where we're going to land on this third point for the rest of the time. He sets this gracious reminder for the Corinthians in the context of future of a hope not yet fulfilled. He says, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, he will strengthen you to the end as you wait, so that you may be blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus. I don't know if you remember, but last, this is Advent Lent, Fred Wise did the first Sunday of Lent last time, and he spent the whole sermon talking about this concept that in the lectionary, at the beginning of every Advent and every Lent, the passages point to the coming of Christ's return. It's as if you can't talk about the beginning, the birth, without talking about the end, him coming back. It's as if Paul here is saying, in an introduction, I'm going to mention three really important things. Christ unifies you together as a church. There's things that he's working on in your life. Those things, they, they won't fully happen yet, but they're going to happen one day when he returns. He does all this in six verses, if you notice, in Corinthians. It's pretty amazing. So our other reading this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, and that points to waiting as well. I'm just going to read a little bit of it. It's from Mark gospel starting with verse 32 about the day or hour that he returns nobody knows neither the angels in heaven nor the son but only the father beware keep alert you don't know when the time will come it's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home he puts his slaves in charge each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to keep on watch therefore keep awake for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening at midnight at the, when, the, when the crow, well, however you say that, rooster crows, however you say that, are at dawn, he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly if you don't stay alert and are awake. This is what I say to you all, keep awake, be alert. 
second coming. Paul mentions it to the Corinthians, the way reminding them that their hope will find completion in Christ. One day, one day all will be well. Mark reminds us, his readers, that they need to be on watch, wait, alert. To some of us in this room, this is really good news. All will be well. Some of us today are here with such heartache and such pain and such despair that the reality and thought of Christ coming back is only, only brings hope. This message is for you. But you know what, to the satisfied in the room, to those of us in this room that are going, life's going okay, I don't, I'm not sitting around every day waiting. This message is maybe even more significant to those of us satisfied, to those of us that are, life is going okay for right now. We're just at a smooth place. And here's why. Here's why. It's not that I would ever want to take away any of your satisfaction. Be grateful if you're in that place. Be so grateful. But it's, it's this. If you're really honest, if you're really honest with yourself, when you get in bed at night and you think about all the gifts and the blessings and the beautiful sunset and your great children or your good marriage or your great relationships, if you're honest, it, they're there's something a little missing. There, there may be hints of something bigger and grander and better, but you know it's not the whole story. And this, this the, the reality of the scriptures today say that. They say this isn't all there is. And if you can recognize that, if you can know that the end of the story is coming, it will inform how we live our life and our days today. So whether we're in despair or whether we're satisfied, this word is speaking to us today. My favorite passage on the return of Christ, my favorite all time, it's kind of my life verse. Maybe you've heard me talk about it before. It's from 1 John 3. For me, this is the picture. because This is, this is what God's word says it'll be like. I don't know the time or day I think so many of us don't pay any attention to scriptures talking about Christ's second coming because it's been Hollywoodized. Will I be baking cookies? Will I be, you know, where will I be? Did I miss it? You know, I'll make jokes about it. And we've kind of mitigated the reality that it's going to happen. But I love 1 John because John is just a guy of the heart. He just cuts to the chase. He doesn't talk about, this is what he says, simple. 1 John 3, this is what we know. This is what we know about Christ's return. When he comes back, when he's revealed, we're going to have a face-to-face -face encounter with him. Just you and Christ, just, just the two of you. That's it. Don't know when, don't know how it's going to work, just know it's going to happen. And when we see him, when we look in his eyes, when we have that encounter, we're going to become like him like that. Why? John tells us why. We're going to see him for who he is. We're going to look in his eyes. We're going to see Christ for who he is. And in an instant, we'll become like him. As true as I'm standing here, that's going to happen for each one of us. Far more true, actually, than my standing here. It's almost so beautiful and so powerful, it's hard for me to talk about. I can only think of a face-to-face -face encounter that I had once in my life that was so intimate and so beautiful that it changed me. And I'm going to tell you, that's a little secret <laughs> in my soul. Um, and it was exactly nine years ago, right now, and it was between Thanksgiving and Christmas. My mom went in the hospital the week of Thanksgiving nine years ago. You've heard me talk about her before. Um, she died on Christmas Day, that, that same season. She couldn't really talk, so it was, my mom was quite a chatter. If you know me very well, that won't surprise you. Um, so there was actually this kind of strange delight to being able to talk to her and just speak and have her take it in. So we had lots of these face-to-face -face encounters. And this one day, I just was reminded of the story with one of my kids. And so I just told my mom the story, and I'm going to tell you what I told her, and then I'm going to tell you where it went in this face-to-face -face encounter. I said, Mom, um, I don't know if I've ever told you the story, but when Quinn was a little boy, 
we used to have that, and I'm sure those of you who have children or have been around children know this little game kids play where you go back and forth, and I love you more to the moon, to the moon and back, to the moon and back a million times. You know, you just play these sweet little games. Well, I was saying, you know, Quinn, I love you so much. You are so chosen that out of all the babies in the world, I would have chosen you, and God gave you to us as a gift. I thought I had one-upped him that he couldn't go any further. I really thought I won the game. And Quinn turns to me and he goes, you know, Mom, when I was in your belly and I looked out on all those moms in the world, I got to choose you. I was like, shoot, he won. I can't beat that. So I'm looking at my mom face to face. She can't speak. And I say, Mom, I would choose you. I would choose you. I just see this little tear. I'll never <laughs> just come out of her eye, go down her face. That's a face-to-face -face encounter. That's what we have coming. But the truth of the matter is, that's what we can have right now. When we see him for who he is, we're going to become like him because we'll see him for who he is. When he's revealed, we're going to see him for who he is. And in seeing him for who he is, we're going to become like him. What a prayer for our Advent. That's my prayer for me. That's my prayer for you. May we see him for who he is. So Paul said grace to you as you open his word. Maybe for you this Advent, it's grace to you. Maybe you just need to open his word. A couple minutes a day, I'm not here to tell you. I am the queen of starting everything and not finishing anything. So Advent actually scares me because I think I'm going to start something and not finish it. I'm not going to put that on myself this Advent. I just want to see him for who he is. and Maybe it will be as I open his word. For, for many of us in here, it's going to be grace with you. Maybe this Advent we need to go out and take that spirit of grace with us to a really hurting neighborhood, community, school, work. Maybe that'll be our Advent. Maybe we'll say, God, come with me as I go. I'm scared. I don't know. But I can tell you what my prayer is for us this morning, that we'd see him for who he is. I'm going to end with a C.S. Lewis quote. I think it says a lot better what I tried to say a few minutes ago. This idea that there's beauty to behold, ultimately we're going to see it face to face. This is C.S. Lewis's idea of the beatific vision, that moment when we'll see Christ for who he is. This is him writing about that. I love it. We do not merely, we do not merely see beauty, though God knows, even though that is bounty enough. We want something else that we can hardly be put into words. We want to be united with beauty. We want to see it, pass into it, receive it into ourselves, bathe in it, and become part of it. That's why the poets tell us such lovely falsehoods. They can't. They talk as if the west wind could really sweep into a human soul, but it can't. They tell us that the beauty is born of a murmuring sound, will pass into the human face, but it won't, or not yet. For if we take the imagery of Scripture seriously, if, we'll, if we believe that God one day will give us the morning star and cause us to put on the splendor of the sun, then we may sur surmise that the ancient myths and the modern poetry, as false as history, may be very near to the truth of prophecy. At present, we are on the outside of the world, the wrong side of the door. We discern the freshness and purity of the morning, but they don't make us fresh and pure. We cannot mingle with the splendors we see. All the leaves of the New Testament are rustling with the rumor that it will not always be so. Especially the two passages today, it will not always be so. Someday, God willing, we shall get in. Father, thank you. Thanks for your word. Thanks for the lectionary that um, ushers in Advent with the end with a face-to-face -face encounter. Help us to get to know you for who you are. That's our prayer this Advent, that we would take the time to see you for who you are.